There's a town hall meeting this Wednesday at seven o'clock. Um, that is a meeting to discuss the church space. There's a few needs that we have to meet, and we have a little bit of church space to talk about um, how to use that. Um, we recently included the apartment as part of the church space so that we have a little bit more room to use. Um, so we uh, welcome your feedback for that. If you filled out a survey, Barb, can you raise your hand? Barb is under this tree, and she would love to take your surveys today. And you can also come and voice your opinion and, and listen to uh, some of the reasoning for um, some of the suggestions, um, which are, of course, not um, decisions that have been made yet. They're just conversation starters. Um, so, yes, if you would like to talk about that in the, the town hall, that's on Wednesday. We ask that you call James Funkhauser and, uh, and let him know that you're going to be coming to that meeting so that we know if there's going to be people that will be here or not. There is a rose this morning. Mary Deal uh, is, has a rose, and this is in honor of Charlie Marie Basor. Charlie was born on uh, May 25th, and her grandmother is here, Donna, um, is here today, and she'll be taking it to the family. So we're grateful for them. They now live um, in Martinsburg, and we're excited to welcome new life. Big, this is Big Brother. <laughs> we normally would have the flower on our communion table during worship, but with the wind, we just didn't want to risk it. Um, so we're, we're thankful to recognize them in new life. Are there any other announcements that you have? And we're flexible, so if today you're here and you have something you'd like to note about the church space for any reason, you can come and bend my ear, no problem. Uh, but it, again, if you are coming Wednesday, do let me know just so I know what I'm doing. Um, when I was growing up in the Knoxville Church of the Brethren, we had a room that they painted and they put a sign on the door and it said, Wet Paint. And all the young adults met there and never took the sign down, and therefore they were called the Wet Paint Group. And I've continued that tradition. I think Wet Paint is a great title for a group that meets in an organic space. We're constantly learning and growing just like Wet Paint before it dries. Um, we have decided, though, that I have children, and a lot of people in the group have children. And even if you don't have children, you might be a child yourself. And so the summertime is just a bit of a challenge uh, for us to get going the way that we'd like to. So we're going to pause. We're going to pause until the fall, and we come back to the fall, I'll let you know a little bit more. We are absolutely going to have that group back together, but it's just been a little difficult with everything, so we'll, we'll come back then. Any other announcements? I'll ask that you turn in your bulletin. There's a responsive call to worship, and I'll just ask you and invite you to stand for the call to worship in our opening hymn. Respond with me. Loving God, life of the universe, we gather to worship you. Great creator who formed us in your image, we gather to worship you. Holy redeemer who became flesh and lived among us, we gather to worship you. Sustaining spirit who breathes into us always the holy breath of life, together we gather to worship you. Amen. The words are in your bulletin. Please sing out, Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. He holy and just by his power we trust in his love great is the lord he is faithful and true by his mercy he proves he is love great is the lord and worthy of glory great is the lord and worthy of praise 
Great is the Lord. Now lift up your voice. Now lift up your voice. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. He is holy and just. By His power we trust in His love. Great is the Lord, He is faithful and true. By His mercy He proves He is love. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of glory. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of praise. Great are you, Lord, I lift up my voice, I lift up my voice. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, You may be seated, and as Teresa is coming up, I'm just going to invite those who are participating in the service project um, to come forward, and any uh, special family members that they'd like to be with them as well. service members come forward. We have Dennis and Rebecca and she brought a little partner with her <laughs> and Gabe and this is Ed from Delaware and he's going to be joining our little group this week. So they will be traveling today after the morning worship after our luncheon to Dayton, Ohio to provide labor and efforts to help people in need after natural disaster. This trip is responding to, to, uh, to tornadoes that passed through Dayton, Ohio two years ago. Dear friends, as we take part in a blessing of this service group, we are reliving a practice of the early church. Serving our brothers and sisters in need is a living sign of our inward faith. In the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit sent Saul and Barnabas for work of mission and the church at Antioch. After prayer and fasting, laid hands on them and sent them out. Jesus himself reached out to lift up the lowly. Micah chapter 6 verse 8 says, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Today, we send our brothers and sister to serve the needs of the world. We bless them for the strengthening of their bonds, for the growth of their faith in God, and for their safety in this mission. I will start a prayer and then ask for you to join me at the end of the prayer in the blessing that is printed in your bulletin. If there are family or close friends that would like to come forward, or anyone in the church, I invite you at this time to come forward and lay hands on these individuals as we pray. If you would like to stay in your seat, you may reach out your arms as we pray this prayer of blessing. So. All 
Calvary. May we pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you have blessed us and enabled us to serve others in need. As we send these volunteers to help others in need, clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may strengthen our trust in you. May these volunteers be changed as the Holy Spirit renews their minds, and may your protection keep them safe in their travels. Lord, we do this out of response for the love you have shown us. May the people we serve know of your love for them and give them hope in the unfortunate situations they find themselves in. You are our foundation and our redeemer. Lord, have mercy. And together we bless them in unison. We bless you, O God, and we give you all the praise and glory. We ask you to bless these, your servants. Fill the hearts of those we are commissioning with the power of the Holy Spirit. We send them forth as messengers of love and peace in your name. Amen. If you're a child, you don't have to go far. You can stay up here for the children's story. Well, good morning. Any more children out there? Yeah? Well, it's good to see you all. Uh, I am very happy to be here with you. The sun is shining, and it's not as humid as it was the other day, is it? It's kind of nice outside. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about our life. Sometimes we can fill our lives up with some very useful things. What are some useful things that we can do in our lives? Do you know? We were just talking about one of the useful things that we can do with our lives. We can serve other people. We can help those who are in need, right? That's one way. What's another way we can put good use to our lives? Any other ways? How about pray for others? That's a good way that we can uh, spend time in our lives. What other ways? Yeah, Emma? Be kind to others. What are some not helpful ways that we can spend our lives? Anybody know? What's that, Emma? I couldn't hear you. That's right. If we hurt people, if we're not kind to them, those are not good ways to spend our lives. Well, I brought with me this little, what is this? It's a balloon. Let me fill this balloon with some hot air, okay? That's hot air, and I want to think of our balloon as our life. Now, if we... If we uh, fill our lives with some hot air, what do you think is going to happen to it when it's under pressure? What's going to happen if I squeeze this real tight? What do you think is going to happen? Pops. It pops? Let's see what happens. I need a volunteer. I want to call my partner in ministry up here. He didn't sign up for this. Oh my. <laughs> Can you hold this? This is going to be our symbol of, of pressure. Now, Go ahead and light that. Now, you might not be able to see, but there's a flame here. And when I put this empty life under pressure, what do you think is going to happen? It's hot. Go ahead and light again. Uh-oh. That's not good. But what do you think we should fill it up with? Water. With water. water. Now... Wait a minute. What happens if it doesn't work out? I don't know. I don't know. It was 
Now, Jesus talked about this a little bit. He met this woman who was at the well, and he was talking to her about her life and how empty it was and how she needed to get water. She spent her day out there in the hot sun in the middle of the day getting water from the well, getting water from the well, and it wasn't really doing her any good. Every single day, she needed to go out and refill herself every single day. And then Jesus met her one day and said, what if I gave you everlasting life? What if I gave you water that would last forever? A life that would be more rich than the life that you have now. What would, what would the benefit be to you? So guess what I brought with me? This is a water balloon. Does anybody want to feel it so that they can see that it's real water? Yeah. Why don't you come up here and feel it? You can see that it's real water in here. Don't squeeze it, though. It's see, it's jiggly. Okay, don't squeeze it. Okay, okay, okay. Feel it? Okay. I'm glad I have a partner in ministry here. <laughs> What do you think is going to happen when we fill, when we um, expose this to some pressure? What do you think is going to happen? All right, let's see what happens. Yeah. What's happening? Nothing's happening to it. That's because Jesus gives us life that will last forever. And so you think about that now as you uh, go about your summer, every time you see a water balloon or play at the water park or go swimming, you think about the everlasting life that God has for you, okay? Let's have a prayer. Great God, I'm thankful for these children. They bring a smile to my face and they remind me of the grace that you show us. Lord, have mercy on us and help us remember what it's like to be young, to be filled with joy, to be taken care of, Lord, help these children to be safe this summer and remind them of the life that you have for them. Amen. Thanks, Gordon. That's great. It seems that this morning we are experiencing an entire service about trusting God. To serve others in need, of course you need to trust God. It's a reflection of the trust that God has for us. The woman at the well surely had to trust Jesus before she received the everlasting life. And as Pam and I transfer our membership to Beaver Creek, and as I am officially installed as pastor here, we are surely trusting God of the unknown situations and challenges that are before us. We trust God, too, that there will be much joy in our time here. This morning, as you consider to give towards God's ministry through our church, know that our offerings are only one way that we show our trust in the Almighty. Uh, as we sing our next song, I... Um, We'll invite our ushers to take the offering uh, collection boxes around. And uh, if you are at home watching the service, of course, you can always give online or you can send checks. Call for songs out loud. 
Stand if you are able. I should hear you well in this one. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You may be seated. Scripture reading this morning comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, At an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way through great endurance and afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as in impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are very well known, as dying and see we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children, open wide your hearts also. Would you pray with me? 
Lord, take our lives as living sacrifices and bless us so that we may be all ministers of your kingdom and servants to your creation. May our offerings this morning be multiplied to the work of your church so that all may know you through love. We also ask for you to bless Gene this morning as he brings the message. May your truth be prevailed through his words. In Christ we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's really good to be with you today, and I want to thank you for the privilege of being able to share with you. Thanks to you, the congregation. Thanks to Pastor Gabe. Um, I preached for about uh, 10 Sundays last fall at Grossnickel, which is my home congregation. And we, for those of you who know that congregation, we were uh, outside uh, back of the church and looking up toward the hill that runs up from the back of the, the church. It was a beautiful setting. Uh, so this reminds me today of, of that. What a, what a glorious Lord's Day and what a beautiful setting. And I am so thankful to be here with you. And I want to commend you for continuing to be carefully aware of COVID. Uh, as we look, as Paul admonished us in Philippians 2, 4, not only to our own interests, but to the interests of others. I believe it's Christian maturity to be a bit behind the world in terms of opening up, which you are. And I also would encourage us to work at maintaining and expanding the virtual connections we've developed during the pandemic, even as we come back together and things get more back to normal. Pastoral Installation Sunday. It's about time. A little thing called COVID has messed with us, but I'm glad that we can finally do this today. It's important, not only symbolically, but at least once in my tenure, it was important functionally, contractually, where a congregational conflict led to a group in the congregation questioning the validity of the contract of a properly called and installed pastor. For the sake of the contract being honored, it was important that the pastor had also been installed. So I've seen a lot, and experience has taught me I haven't yet seen it all. But still, I know this congregation and you well enough to know that what we're doing here this morning is of a more symbolic than contractual import. It's the public recognition of what is already happening. You are taking Gabe into your hearts as your pastor, even as he is taking you into his heart. I invite us to picture pastor this morning. Some people have a picture in their mind of what a pastor is, should be, a supernatural woman, superman, and for some of the early boomers and late and still living of the greatest generation or for, and I'll qualify this by saying, in my opinion, the more biblically myopic among us, it has to be a man that, ob that obscures the flesh and blood human person in the role. This story was told to demonstrate what paradigm paralysis is. Do you know what paradigm paralysis means? I haven't the foggiest, even after I heard this story. First of all, I always thought it was pronounced paradigm. I had to ask my daughter Elise, who's a card-carrying member of Mensa, how to spell it. It was about a man who had two prized possessions. He was a professional man. He worked hard. But every weekend, he had a cabin in the mountains, and he loved to go there. 
In order to get there, he used his second most prized possession, a high-powered sports car that was just the perfect vehicle to take him up that winding road to his mountain cabin. This particular weekend, he was on his way to the cabin, and he was winding his way up, enjoying this fine sports car as he weaved around the turns, and finally he came to the most difficult hairpin, most dangerous curve on the whole mountain, to which he had to come almost to a dead stop, fortunately, for coming around the corner completely out of control was another car careening back and forth from one side of the road to the other, and he was sure he was going to be hit. But just as the car came to him and got over to the other side and flashed by him, the woman yelled out the window, pig, and he yelled back, sow. And he sat there shaking a little bit after it was all over, and he thought, the nerve of that woman. I was perfectly still. She was the one out of control and she had the nerve to call me a pig. Well, then he thought, well, anyhow, I got off a pretty good one and I called her a sow. So we put the car in gear, roared around the curve and ran smack into the pig. I don't know what paradigm paralysis is, but I'll tell you what that story is all about. If we're thinking in a particular frame of reference, it's pretty hard to think any other way. Too often, I have seen church members see their pastor as an adversary instead of an ally, viewed pastor as a role rather than a real relationship, focused on past pastoral paradigms and pictures of ministry, rather than the person present here in the 21st, rather than the mid 20th century. The world has changed. The church today, as the old commercial said, and some of you will remember this with me, the church today is not your father's Oldsmobile. As we welcome a pastor, we have this little line in our installation liturgy. I will affirm him or her as a person with needs similar to my own. Too often we see what we have been conditioned to see and expect in a minister, rather than the real person who stands before us. Picture pastor as an object rather than a person. To use Martin Buber's distinction as an I-it rather than an I-thou relationship. And too often I have seen the church use our leaders up and throw them away rather than extend Christian caring and concern to them and their families to care for their spiritual and physical health and welfare to treat them as we would like to be treated. And I believe Jesus said something to that effect. It is an incredibly difficult, demanding, and draining time to be a pastor. COVID-19 has put that on steroids. Church and cultural realities are shifting. This past Holy Week, Gallup reported that for the first time in their eight decades of polling, Americans' membership in houses of worship dropped below 50%. Only 47% of Americans report they belong to a church, synagogue, or mosque, down from 70% in just 1999. That's a cultural an ecclesiological earthquake. Bill Galtieri of Soul Shepherding reports that pastors and other ministry leaders are often under so much stress 
that they may find themselves hanging on by just a thread, about to burn out from exhaustion or blow out morally. He says the expectations that persons put on their pastors and the pastors put on themselves can be debilitating. Here are some statistics from the Fuller Institute of Church Growth and the Francis A. Schaeffer Institute of Church Leadership Development Research Studies. 75% of pastors report being extremely stressed or highly stressed. 90% of pastors work between 55 to 75 hours a week. 90% feel fatigued and worn out every week. 70% say they're grossly underpaid. 70% constantly fight depression. 77% of pastors feel they do not have a good marriage. 38% are divorced or divorcing. 70% do not have someone they consider a close friend. While I acknowledge that Paul was making some finer theological points in the scripture that Gabe read for you this morning, and that I'm interpreting that scripture more eisegetically than exegetically, which is never a good thing, I would also point out that at the least, Paul is saying that ministry involves suffering. And I would note that suffering is sometimes caused by abuse. Ministering to Ministers reports that according to studies by the Alban Institute and Fuller Seminary, 50% of ministers drop out of ministry within the first five years and may never go back to the church again. A Duke study found that 85% of seminary graduates entering ministry leave within five years, and 90% of all pastors will not stay till retirement. The North Georgia clergy study attrition rate ran as high as 90% for those having served 20 years or more. Many of these ministers leave to preserve what is left of their families, their sanity, their health, and their faith. Just this past week, my Council of District Executive colleagues and I received this email from Dana Cassell, who directs the Thriving in Ministry program for the Church of the Brethren Office of Ministry. She wrote, hello, code colleagues. Here in the Office of Ministry and our part-time pastor, full-time church program, we're noticing a trend of young, early career pastors recently tendering resignations from their congregations most without another pastorate or other employment lined up. We'd like to invite a group of these folks to gather for a conversation if they're willing both to provide space to process among colleagues with similar experiences and to learn what we can from these young pastors who are not finding pastoral ministry to be a sustainable vocation. We also have resources to offer a longer-term clergy coaching cohort for these folks if that seems like something they would find valuable. We have a small group of these pastors who have agreed to join the conversation, but realize that you all may know of other early career pastors who would benefit from participating. Feel free to share this note with anyone who comes to mind as a part of this group and invite them to be in touch directly with me if they're interested. Signed at Peace, Dana. The Auburn Institute has studied what they label as clergy killers, individuals and congregations that are hazardous to the health and well-being of ministers and their families. I've seen them. Lloyd Redinger says that though some conflict in the church is normal, there are some types of conflict which are abnormal and abusive. And within some congregations, there are personalities who seek to unsettle the relationship between minister and congregation. 
there are some strategies for dealing with clergy killers, but such individuals and congregations take a tremendous toll. I had graduated from Elizabethtown College in the spring and been accepted to begin as a student at Drew Theological Seminary beginning in the fall. That summer, my Uncle Paul, a lifelong United Methodist minister and his family, visited us. Uncle Bobby, Uncle Paul, we called him Bobby. Uncle Bobby, I excitedly told him, I'm going to Drew to study to be a minister. Now, I thought he'd jump up and down with joy. To my surprise, he did not. He looked at me, really looked at me. There was a long pause. My Aunt Shirley appeared shocked and looked sadly and sympathetically at me. And then my uncle said, don't do it unless you have to. I've had to over these past 40 years as a youth minister, state park chaplain, assistant minister, interim minister, pastor, senior pastor, lead pastor, district executive minister. But if you got me alone and asked me over a glass of Oktoberfest over at the Stuba, I might confide to you that ministry has been hazardous to the health and well-being of myself, my marriage, and my family over the course of the years. It's taken a toll, but I've done it because I had to. So Gabe, I'd tell you to run, not walk for the hills. Run away, run away. But I suspect you wouldn't and you won't because you have to do this. You feel called to this. And I am sure that as you do this, like Eric Lytle, the Presbyterian missionary, and martyr, and 1924 Paris Olympics 400 meters gold medalist, you would say that as you do, you feel God's pleasure. Gabe's one of our very finest young pastors. I know I'm preaching to the choir. You have a wonderful record of relationship with pastors, but I encourage you, take care of him, support him, pray with him, pray for him, partner with him. I talked with Connie Burkholder, who is the interim DE for Illinois Wisconsin District. I guess it was some weeks ago now. It was right after she had just had her garden tilled. Connie said that the church member who did it for her told her when he had finished, this is a place of promise. This is a place and a partnership of promise. May Jesus Christ make it fruitful for the Lord's good purposes for years to come. Some encouragements for the years ahead for you as pastor and people. Assume the best of your pastor. Remember that with very few exceptions, pastors are doing this because they are called. They have to. They love their people. They want to nurture their members' faith and spiritual health and walk beside them in the ups and downs of life. They are not trying to shirk work. Indeed, ministry is truly 24-7. Unlike some other occupations, ministers can never fully leave it at the door. And it's been more intense with COVID because there's no door to leave it at. And there are some cycles where a pastor has three deaths, funerals in a week, a sermon and worship to prepare, and it's love feast week, and someone is critically ill, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Periods that are absolutely physically, emotionally, spiritually exhausting, and it takes a toll. And there needs to be a time for recovery and recuperation. If you want a pastor who will nurture and nourish you, insist that he take all his allotted vacation time. Provide for coverage in his absence, whether that's in somewhere away land or in his living room. 
And that vacation needs to include more than a day or two here and there. All pastors have at least three weeks vacation, and I believe Gabe has four weeks based on years of service. At least one full week should be taken as a seven-day block of time. And best practice would be at least two of the four weeks of vacation back-to-back -back annually. It takes that long to get away mentally, spiritually, to get renewed and refreshed. If you want to see what happens when that doesn't occur, look at me. It's not pretty. Pastors need a week a year for continuing education, which regularly needs to include a quality continuing education event, which requires $1,000 to $1,500 a year. Congregations I've served and the district over the past 11 plus years have supported me in doing some extended continuing education, clinical pastoral education, and a couple of quality certificate programs. Such opportunities over the years have been nothing less than sustaining for me and my ministry. And I have always felt that the church has gotten more than a fair return on their investment through what I've been able to bring back and share. A mutually negotiated and agreed upon measurable job description in the form of standards of performance is absolutely essential for, pre for preventing pastoral burnout and contributing to a fruitful, long-lasting pastoral congregational relationship. Give time and attention each year to mutually renegotiating the pastoral congregational contract agreement. Remember that the Church of the Brethren salary scale is the minimum recommended figure based upon education and experience. I know of congregations where stewardship commitment emphases have been planned to support or expand the pastoral program. My predecessor, Don Rao, taught me that pastors are a congregation's greatest resource. Without fail, schedule an annual review. There should be mutual conversation between congregational leadership and pastor about what's going well and should be continued and built upon, and then where the challenges are and how they might be addressed, and then a couple of mutually agreed upon goals for the coming year. Finally, three true things for what they may be worth to you. Rabbi, family therapist, and leadership consultant Edwin Friedman who wrote the book on church and family systems, literally, his monumental Generation to Generation, noted that there's no way a pastor or any of us can corner all the knowledge expected of us. But more important than any expertise needed to be a pastor or a leader to put and hold things together is the basic ability to put ourselves together to know and be who we are, self-differentiation. To a great extent, putting others together depends upon putting ourselves together, a great book to read. And from Roy Oswald of Alban Institute, he asked the question, what do church members most value in their pastor? The answer is authenticity. And he also asked the question, what do church members most want to know about their pastor? And the answer is, does he like me? Gabe, sisters and brothers, may God richly bless you together as pastor and people, as you cultivate this place of promise and look toward the harvest for this church and community that God desires and shall surely provide. Amen.
Would you join in singing the first three verses of Take My Life? Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee, swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from Thee, filled with messages from Thee. Well, Pam and Elias are coming. I uh, want to uh, recognize that Gabe and Pam have requested and it's been received their uh, transfer of memberships from Montezuma Church of the Brethren in Shenandoah District to Beaver Creek here in Mid-Atlantic. And it is my joy and privilege with you to recognize that. And uh, even while we're installing uh, Pastor Gabe today, I hope that you'll be able to say an official, <laughs> I know you've said many uh, other words of welcome, but I hope that you'll be able to say an official word of welcome to uh, Pam and to Gabe as members of Beaver Creek Congregation. So the Church of the Brethren throughout its history has embraced the concept of the believer's church and the priesthood of all believers. Thus, when persons are baptized, they are ordained into the ministry of the church. But to assist the members in this shared ministry, the Church of the Brethren calls men and women to special tasks and ordains them for set-apart roles of leadership. Such persons are recognized as having the gifts and training that qualify them for special leadership responsibilities. These gifts include such gifts as preaching, teaching, counseling, evangelism, administration, and other specialized services in the life of the church. So today we finally officially formally celebrate an important moment in the life of the Beaver Creek congregation. And I couldn't be happier about it as we install a person to lead you in ministry. You have called Gabe Dodd to be a servant in the name of Christ in this place and Barb Lewis as the church board chairperson and representing the congregation will say an official word of welcome. We, the Beaver Creek Church of the Brethren, led by God's Spirit, have called you, Gabe Dodd, to be our pastor. We have invited you to become a part of our family of faith and to serve among our people and in our community. And normally at this time in an installation service, we would be introducing our new pastor <laughs> to the congregation, but he has been here for seven months and we are learning to know and love him. And so um, I'll just say that we have Pastor Gabe and we have his wife Pam and his son Elias. Thank you, Barbara. So Gabe, 
you've been called to be the pastor of the Beaver Creek Congregation of the Church of the Brethren. You've accepted the call. Do you believe that the call and your acceptance of it are in response to the leading of the Holy Spirit? I do. Will you be constant in prayer, a faithful interpreter of Scripture, a pursuer of the truth, and a proclaimer of the Word of God as it is understood and practiced by the Church of the Brethren? I will. Will you attempt to live honestly, openly, and justly with your brothers and sisters in this congregation? Will you seek to be sensitive to the needs of each person? Will you work diligently to fulfill your assigned responsibilities? And will you represent the Beaver Creek congregation to the wider community in a way that will embody the teachings of the New Testament? I will. So, brother, I charge you in the presence of God and these people to be faithful to the vows you've just taken. Let the words addressed to Timothy also be spoken to you. Proclaim the message. Be persistent, whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. Always be sober, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, carry out your ministry fully. May God give you the gift of the Holy Spirit for the work of ministry now committed to you in this congregation. Remember that God did not give us the spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Brothers and sisters, you have called Gabe Dodd to be your pastor, and he has responded to your call and has promised to perform faithfully the responsibilities of this ministry. It is your responsibility to give Dave, Gabe your loyal support. Undergird him and his work with your prayers. Grant your pastor the freedom to be the person God has uniquely created him to be and encourage your pastor in the expression and use of the gifts that he uniquely possesses. Be with him a mutual seeker of the truth, a learner of the way, and a co-worker in the kingdom. Appreciate the heritage of the Church of the Brethren in recognizing the freedom of the pulpit. Be a good employer to your pastor, exercising fairness and honesty in all your agreements. If you will now pledge your support and your full cooperation to the pastor you have called, I invite you to stand as you're able and to join in the expression of welcome and support which is printed in your bulletin this morning. I receive Gabriel Dodd as pastor of this church in the ministry to which God is calling this congregation. I will support our new pastor with my prayers and sincere cooperation. I will affirm him as a person with needs similar to my own and will confront him in love when I question his actions or judgment. I intend to be a partner with him as we seek the truth, learn the way, and work together in the kingdom. I pray God's blessings upon you, Gabe, as you become our pastor and upon all of us as we share in this ministry. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is very important. In the name of Jesus Christ and by the authority of the Mid-Atlantic District of the Church of the Brethren, it is my joy and privilege to now affirm that Gabriel Dodd is officially installed as pastor of the Beaver Creek Congregation. Gabe, Beaver Creek, may God richly bless this new relationship of pastor and people. Amen. And pastor Gabe, on behalf of this congregation, I receive you as our pastor. We have heard your vows and we have heard and you have heard our promises. This is a covenant we have made together. Let us join in a prayer of consecration. Okay. If there's anyone else that would like to join 
Pastor Gabe here as I offer this prayer. Please come forward now. O oh God, by whom your people are called to give service through the church, we ask your blessing upon the covenant we have made together as pastor and people. We thank you for the calling to ministry that comes to all of us. On this day, we are especially glad for the calling to pastoral ministry. Be a source of strength and power to Gabe, whom we have now installed Endow him with the gifts of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Bind him to the hearts of each member of this congregation. Impart to him wisdom and courage to deal with problems and difficulties, as well as humility in experiencing success and blessing. May we all live and work together within this family of faith so that we will be able to bear witness to the presence and power of your kingdom among us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Um, before you sit, um, I just want to say thank you. Uh, it's been a very rich time the last seven months of getting to know the congregation, a time of um, trying new things and being innovative in a time of challenge and change. Um, we have learned to know that the church is not about program. It's about the work of Jesus Christ. And so as I am here serving with you as pastors, uh, I want to emphasize that we are all called to ministry, and I'm excited to work alongside you as a minister. Um, I hope that um, God continues to guide us together, um, not just me, but also you, that we can equip each other for the challenges ahead and look to see where God uh, is placing us in the vision that God has for our church. Um, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I, I think that um, God is speaking to us in many ways, and we're learning to, to be able to recognize God's voice. So um, thank you. I look forward to many years here uh, with our family and, um, and the ministry that God has for us. silver and my gold, not a might would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose, every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own, it shall be thy royal throne, it shall be thy royal throne. 
Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever on thee, all for thee, ever on thee, all for thee. Before benediction, if Teresa or somebody could come forward and give some direction for the celebration. Um, that would be very helpful. So may God bless you and keep you. May the very face of God shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may God's presence embrace you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>